Hello, everyone. I'm um, Lex Herman, Center for Geographic Analysis. I'm the co-chair of our seminar series now. And uh, today, I'm very pleased that uh, Leif Isaacson can join us in his busy schedule. Uh, Will Wintour, as he's usually taking somewhere. Um, Leif is not only the uh, one of the co-principal investigators of Palavio's Commons, which is a very important link to open data project for geographic and historical data. But he's also the, uh, I think, senior lecturer on digital humanities at Lancaster now. Um, and I think you'll find his talk very interesting. Thanks very much for being with us. Take it away, Lee. Well, thank you very much, Lex. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for this so much. Uh, this is really, really great. Um, and yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, certainly, well, I hope you, you are, but I'm really looking forward to um, telling you about what we've been up to. Um, and this, this, there's plenty of time for discussion. Um, I'll try afterwards. Uh, and if you have any questions um, in the middle, then I would really encourage you to, to do that. I think uh, one of the core uh, principles behind the Pelagios project that I'll be talking about is its a, a community aspect. And, and so uh, I'd really like this to be a, as, as much a conversation um, as a presentation. Uh, as Lex mentioned, um, I'm not the only person involved uh, in Pelagios. Um, these are some of the other people involved. Um, so um, Elvin Barker and Reiner Seaman have worked with for um, a long time. Uh, I'm going to be presenting a lot of Reiner's work uh, in terms of Recognito 2, which is a, uh, an annotation platform I'll be telling you about later on. Uh, and we have two relatively um, recent members of our investigators who have joined us, um, Valeria Vitali and, and Rebecca Kahn, uh, the Institute of Classical Studies uh, and the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. Um, today, uh, there's actually this is one of, um, as again, Liz, let's mention one of um, several things I'll be doing. So um, this is going to be mo mostly me kind of talking and, and presenting in a kind of PowerPoint way uh, some of the stuff that we're doing. Um, afterwards, for any of you who are interested in sticking around, uh, we'd love to have a, a kind of conversation about the nature uh, of uh, collaboration and especially lightweight linked data um, opportunities. Because um, one thing we re believe really strongly. Uh, is that linked data is a pretty um, pointless exercise if you're doing it by yourself. Um, so thinking about ways in which we can do this uh, more collectively would be uh, really important. Um, and then uh, at five o'clock, sorry, five thirty this afternoon um, down at MIT uh, at the Haydn Library, uh, we have a workshop um, which is a tutorial uh, on using Repeto two. So if any of you are around and uh, interested, then that's an open workshop, and you're very welcome to, to join us for that. Um, details at the end. Okay, so before I talk about um, Pelagios, it's probably worth saying that Pelagios is situated in a, um, in a wider context um, uh, of, of linked open data in the humanities. And what do, what do we mean by that um, when we talk about linked open data? Because um, the wonderful thing about um, the semantic web and linked data is it means different things to different people. Um, but what, when we think about uh, this is um, about the kind of connection uh, of different kinds of online resources uh, together. So we're really interested in the, um, the webbiness of the semantic web and the linkiness of, of linked data. And in particular, uh, we divide between different kinds of uh, resources uh, that are online, from different, so the, or different resources, different organizations, uh, providing different uh, kinds of uh, functionality, if you will, within that network. So we can divide on the one hand between what we might call resource curators. Um, and those are uh, the kinds of um, web resource that most people are familiar with when they think about the web. So stuff that has pages, stuff that has web addresses, um, it might be databases uh, of historical content or uh, a repository of text uh, or, or, or anything really. Um, on the other side, and I think this is a more recent development, um, we have a number of resources that we can kind of think of like schemes or schemata that uh, provide URIs, or so global, uh, globally addressable identifiers uh, for different kinds of concept schemes. Um, we're particularly interested uh, in uh, gazetteers, so the concept schemes which contain, which give us URIs for places, uh, but just as you can have them for places, you can also have them for people or events, uh, or in fact anything um, essentially that we can, can think about, somebody could, could, could conceivably produce a URI for. And then somewhere in the middle of that, there are a whole range of different projects that try and tether these things together and make use of, um, of both of them to enrich uh, the, the web universe. Uh, and Pelagios is, in a sense, one of those. Uh, I, I, I do want to underline that Pelagios, as uh, ultimately an academic uh, uh, um, uh, 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 
project is not really about providing, is not um, driven by a desire to produce permanent functionality or infrastructure. So we are much more focused on, on the one hand, exploring a space, um, showing and demonstrating what the possibilities of the open data are, uh, and secondly, um, trying to support a crypto growing and uh, emerging community of practice um, around those ideas um, and facilitating that process. So the various things that we do uh, are, um, uh, our infrastructure in a way that, uh, that, that duct tape and string and, and, uh, and blue tape are uh, infrastructure in that we, we're trying to take different things together, bring them together, plug gaps where they exist, um, and in doing so, uh, demonstrate some of the possibilities, but always in essentially with the vision that at some point or another, people will take um, some of those ideas and replace them with better stuff. Uh, and that's, that's um, ultimately, I think, where, where uh, our vision on sustainability lies. So what is Palladios specifically, um, if we kind of think of it in that, within that wider context? Um, well, where we rather snappily refer to it as a decentralized community and infrastructure uh, for linked open geodata in the humanities. So we are, are a, it's decentralized in that most of what we try to do is avoid some, uh, wherever we can, avoid mechanisms where everything is reliant uh, on one central um, great um, master controller. So we believe in the uh, traditional Berners-Lee vision of the web, um, that we're trying to um, reduce, it, as it were, uh, a, a network of information that doesn't have a center. Uh, it's a community in the sense that it's, uh, it involves people and real people and real organizations, and they're driven by, by specific motivations to do certain kinds of things. And so one of the things we always have to think about is not what would be, you know, what would be our ideal in some kind of wonderful, perfect, altruistic universe, um, but rather, what does it mean when you have lots of people who have different uh, motivations, and how can we allow each of them, how can we motivate them uh, to work together and um, achieve at least some of their aims uh, in participating uh, collectively in doing this kind of thing. Uh, it's an infrastructure, as I mentioned before, in that we do provide, or we have been developing, uh, a number of tools and platforms um, to facilitate the production and use of linked token data, um, but that is predominantly uh, in a kind of demonstrative capacity. Um, and it's linked open geodata, it's linked open data in the sense that we um, are based on a, a URI, an RDF-based framework. Um, for the, those of you with a technical background, um, I'll talk a, a little bit about those later on, but not, not a lot. Uh, geodata in that we're particularly interested in places, uh, and geography, uh, and the humanities uh, in that we're interested in any of the humanities, but and especially in the past, so archaeology, classics, history, um, things um, of that nature. Might be helpful for me just briefly. I'd be interested to know just in terms of people, people's backgrounds here. Um, who here is would kind of mostly put themselves in a kind of the technical end of the spectrum in terms of their interests? Great, uh, a little over half maybe, uh, and, and who be more than the humanities end of the spectrum? Uh, yeah, quite kind of a few, and then obviously I'm assuming there's kind of you know who's a, a digital humanists. Yeah, uh, we've got a few of those two. Great, excellent. Okay, so I'll, I'll kind of pitch this mostly for the, for the middle. So things that Pelagios isn't, uh, so we, yes, we don't believe in being the, 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 the one ring. Um, we have a very um, kind of capacious understanding of what uh, linked open data and semantic um, web can be. Um, we're not a data aggregator, although we do in fact uh, do some aggregating of data, um, but the idea is not that we are a central repository that, that kind of brings every else's stuff together um, as, as um, sort of centralized, particular repository. Um, we're not a standardized data model in that um, we do use data models, but those models are annotations that connect between different data. So we don't want to tell people, ah, you've got some really interesting stuff, and it would be even better if you now uh, use my database schema or my ontology and so on. We're trying to allow people um, very much as far as possible uh, to continue to use, uh, to keep their data in the form that it, it, it was originally structured. We're interested um, as well um, in connectivity specifically uh, through common references rather than a common schema. So we're interested in people being able to say, I'm talking about this place, uh, I'm talking about this person, for example, I'm talking about an event, rather than um, carving up the world in an ontology uh, of, say, authors or um, a, a, a battle uh, sites or whatever it might be. So we're not trying to divide them in, in that way. How does that process work? Um, well, very simply, it's, uh, it's what we call semantic annotation. Um, and it works something like this. So we can think of some kind of web resource that's online. 
Um, here, is, here is an example, a few more books, another page, uh, for text, and this is of Herodotus' histories. It's interesting that it's online because that can give us a URI, it can give us a global reference for that particular document itself. So we can say, there's this thing on the web that I want to talk about. And within that particular resource, um, we may have, uh, in a variety of different ways, um, a number of, of, of strings of characters. So here we have some uh, S-P-A-R-T-A -A, uh, and A-T-H-E-N-S. And by presenting this in my PowerPoint, um, in uh, about um, 20 or times or so, um, there has been what I like to call the semantic miracle has occurred, because each of you have taken those strings of characters together and parsed them into a word, uh, and then placed that in terms of your own understanding of a, of a real place uh, in the world. So um, you've thought about it possibly and assumed that this is not Athens in Georgia, uh, but in fact is Athens uh, in Athens. Um, the great thing about the semantic web, the second great thing about the semantic web, of course, is that computers cannot do semantics. Computers don't think or have some kind of conscious deliberation about where these things are. All that, can, that computers can do uh, is symbol matching. So one of the things uh, that we do with the semantic web is to associate these strings of characters with web addresses, with, web, with global identifiers that may or may not be resolvable. It may be something that I can put into a browser and get some information back. Even if it doesn't, even if I can't resolve it, it still works as an identifier uh, across with, if I have multiple references, for example, uh, to Athens here. Um, and in this particular case, I've done this against a gazetteer uh, called Pleiades, um, and that gives me URIs for uh, Athens in Attica and Sparta. So if I put those into my browser, I get a page back uh, saying, yeah, this is Athens in Attica, and I'm providing some information about it, perhaps such as coordinates, for example. Um, what we can do with texts, we can also do with images. So um, here we have uh, a, um, a, a, oh, shit, how embarrassing, I can't remember who the, um, the author of this map is. Uh, in any case, we've, we've annotated regions of it. Uh, we have the text um, associated with it, and we can identify here Rome, uh, here Jerusalem. In this case, we're using a different gazetteer. Uh, we're using past place uh, rather than, than Pleiades, uh, because Pleiades is a gazetteer for the ancient world, um, and past place uh, is for a later historical period. Oops. So, um, so why this? None of this seems, in and of itself, terribly interesting. Of course, right? so, so why, why do we go to the bother? Uh, of taking these fragments of text, these fragments of images, um, and associating those with URIs. What's, what's the big uh, win in doing so? Well, individually, uh, each annotation itself is not terribly interesting. But what is interesting is that it connects together two different information domains. So we can think of uh, kind of a gazetteer space, so here we, let's say Pleiades, uh, and we have a bunch of different places, and they have relationships between them. Um, those can be defined in all sorts of uh, ways, so it might be the distance between them, or the traveling distance between them, uh, there might be political relationships, or part whole, meriological relationships, and so forth. Otherwise, we have, uh, we can talk about kind of ancient world resources online, and they may be connected together in other kinds of ways. Um, typically through HTML links, for example. Um, and every time we produce uh, an annotation in Colloquios, then of course we're producing a bridge between those two different information spaces. And by building these bridges, we can also start to build bridges between, even within, these different information spaces. So over here, we have a couple of documents which are not obviously related, but by producing two annotations, we now know that these two documents are related by the fact that they both refer to the same place. Um, and what we can do in one direction, we can do in the other direction as well. So it may be interesting that particular places tend to co-occur in specific documents. So to take a, uh, a banal example, uh, somebody who knows nothing about ancient history, it may strike me as interesting and unusual that Rome and Athens and Constantinople continuously seem to be referred uh, together uh, with one another, despite the fact that, of course, um, this, they're, they're distributed spatially uh, throughout the Mediterranean. And the great thing about these links is of course, that I can drill straight back to those, those particular references uh, and ask why. You know, what, what is the context in which these are, are being co-referred to? Um, and and uh, what might that tell us about those locations uh, and the relationships between them? We talked a little bit about um, gazetteers. Um, of course, there is a bit of a, uh, an elephant in the room with that. Um, we talk about centralization and decentralization. Is if I'm pegging all of my documents to a particular gazetteer, okay, that's great because then I know, right, I have my URI for Rome. Uh, so 
Um, I've got a reference to Rome. You've got a reference to Rome. We both point to Pleiades. We can now crosswalk between my stuff uh, and your stuff. The problem that arises, of course, is that if Pleiades has a, a URI to Rome and past place, another gazetteer has a reference to Rome, then our chain of connectivity is broken. So one of the things that Pelagios has done <coughs> then is uh, define um, an interconnection format for gazetteers so that they can align with one another. Um, and that means that you can reference past place, and I can reference Pleiades, uh, and if somebody has done the alignment between them, to say that this Rome is the same as that Rome, then we can still walk between our uh, documents. So we're um, trying to decentralize uh, in that method, in, in that way, um, so that we don't have total reliance on particular pieces of infrastructure wherever possible. Um, so now we're just going to talk a little bit about some of the benefits um, that we think you can get from doing what is essentially a reasonably, um, uh, I like to say it's a reasonably simple process. It seems simple to produce these, these um, basic annotations that point on the one hand to a document and the one hand um, to a gazetteer entry. Of course, it's not that simple because it involves human beings. Right? We're, we're not just churning this thing through um, some kind of automated uh, mechanism. Well, as you'll see later on, we are churning it through an automated mechanism, but then we're getting the human being into the loop uh, to, um, to work with that. So one thing is we can, of course, we can have browser-based interactive maps. So here, somebody's annotated places in the, uh, the Odyssey. Uh, we can put those uh, on the nice little map. Now I can click on places, and it can give me um, the various references um, to those places. So I can read, um, I can read a, a text in map form, if you like, and look at it in a sort of spatial form, uh, and see what a particular text or a series of texts perhaps um, might might have to say about those particular places. I can also aggregate lots of that data together, um, perhaps, and um, and use heat maps to show. Uh, the particular focus of a text or a collection or a, or, um, a, a text um, or images just to see what are the particular places that get most uh, particular or are especially focused upon. Uh, and um, so here we've got an example of, of DLOS. Um, and the nice thing is that that can grow over time as well. So we, there is a, a trend for uh, what we call what they call deep maps, so sort of GIS systems where we can click on a place and have a bunch of information associated with it. Uh, we like to refer to these as bottomless maps because over time, of course, you that um, as more and more people annotate content, then that that content uh, grows uh, over time. Um, we can uh, do things uh, like word clouds. So we talked about the co-occurrence. So here, um, this is a co-occurrence of, of uh, DLOS with other places within the kind of gazetteer. Uh, we can see that Athens is the place that gets talked about most most commonly uh, in, uh, in association with DLOS. And um, again, because everything is hyperlinked, uh, we can have a list of various resources that we can click on here. Uh, again, drill straight back into the actual data, the actual references um, that talk about um, DLOS to find out um, what it is that they want to say about it. We try to make it as easy as possible, not just to have a central location so that you would <coughs> search for content associated with the place. Um, but we can also make it possible uh, that people who have annotated their content because they've associated URIs with the place references within their resources, uh, then uh, can automatically generate um, links to search services, which can then uh, say, oh, here's all the other stuff that relates to uh, uh, the particular resource that I'm telling you about. So there's examples here uh, from the Heidelberg uh, Epigraphic Database, uh, another one from the Institute, the Journal of the Institute of the, uh, for the Study of the Ancient World, uh, and the Open Context Repository for Archaeological Data. Um, all of them um, here are represent have a page which will be talking uh, about a particular um, place. Um, maybe it's associated with something in a journal article. Maybe it's associated with a particular archaeological find. Uh, and then they can, for their users, say, "Oh, here, here are a range of other related resources related to the place that is related in turn uh, to the thing that you happen to be looking at um, right now." So each of these different resources can act as a shop window for lots of other resources. So it becomes the really important thing is to become a two-way street. It's not about trying to you know, be a sort of super Google where you go through uh, and have to go. It's not about portalizing, if you will, uh, linked data, but you but genuine linked data where um, everything is uh, a window to everything else. Uh, we can um, use our data to summarize content in various ways. Um, so here, uh, for, for a, a Facebook project called Polygos 3, uh, we annotated place references in, in um, early geographic uh, documents, and one of the particular uh, um, genres or periods we were looking at was early Greek documents. 
Um, and it may surprise you that Sparta, rather than Athens, is in fact the most commonly, within those that particular um, uh, set of documents, uh, Sparta appears to be more frequently referred to um, than Athens. Uh, I talked about heat maps before. Again, you can see um, here, I think, is the, the Greek tradition. Uh, this is the Roman tradition. Uh, and again, you can see kind of fairly clearly how the, the focus, if not necessarily um, the full range, so the, the, the width if you, or, or the, the breadth, uh, is not too far off between the, the, the Greek world and the Roman world. But clearly, the places which are being referred to in the Roman world uh, are much more distributed. So in the Greek world, uh, things out to the west are kind of few and far between. So it's not just about producing overall maps and saying this is the Greek world, uh, but, but being able to show which are the particular places in the Greek world that people uh, were interested in talking about. Uh, we've been developing, um, in terms of that search, we have a, a new service that Reiner's, um, I said, well, a, a newish service, uh, because we won the um, 2016 Digital Humanities Award for Best Data Visualization. Um, so this is a really nice system that Reiner's put together where you can zoom in. Uh, we have um, up here, uh, we have dates associated with references as well. Um, we, can, uh, we can filter through by different sources, languages, um, types of objects, and so on. And as you zoom in uh, and pan in uh, the map, you can uh, explore the, the, either an individual data set or a series of data sets together uh, to see their spatial and temporal distribution. Uh, we can um, take uh, network-based approaches to uh, associating different kinds of documents. So here, um, I think we have the, um, I hope I've got this right, uh, the red, each of these red circles uh, represents early Roman uh, or early Latin geographic documents. Uh, green ones talk about uh, our references to um, to early Greek geographic documents, uh, and the purple ones are Byzantine. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, it turns out that Romans tend to talk about the same things, kinds of places that other Romans talk about, and Greeks tend to talk about the same uh, things as other Greeks, uh, because each of these um, uh, edges between these nodes is weighted by the, uh, the, the, the connections, the number of co-occurrences that have between those documents. But there are one or two interesting ones uh, um, over here. There's a big purple one that seems to be in the middle of Greek and Roman stuff, right? Not associated with Byzantine. Uh, and it turns out that that's not so surprising because that's the Suda, uh, which is a big encyclopedia uh, of not just places but other contents as well. It's mostly harvested from Greek and Roman sources, so that's why um, it's associated with other kinds of Greek and Roman documents. However, much more uh, clustered together, we have here a bunch of itineraries um, of the Holy Land and Rather unsurprisingly, um, they all kind of cluster together because they often talk about kind of similar places. As well as being linked data, one of the challenges of working with linked data is that if we're using these um, uh, network-based uh, models of connections, um, typically uh, lots of that we don't often have to, uh, tools that use those kinds of that kind of network data very well. And there are all sorts of, of, of um, reasons uh, for doing that. Not least of which is kind of the tractability of dealing with complex uh, network graphs. <laughs> um, but what, what we certainly can do is take that um, and bundle it up with things like CSV uh, and export that kind of um, RDF in ways that can then be um, used, say, in, in, in anything from spreadsheets to databases to geographic information systems. Um, and if we have coordinates associated uh, with these particular places, remember Gazetteer doesn't necessarily have to have coordinates, but it might do. Um, then we can export those as well. Uh, so here we have um, two separate uh, itineraries, uh, one called the Micarella Goblets, that runs down there from uh, Cadiz in Spain all the way to Rome, uh, and one called the Bordeaux Itinerary, that runs from Bordeaux to Jerusalem and back again. Um, and we can plot those on a, on a map. And we can also see by doing that kind of thing just how much, despite these coming from quite different um, periods of, in the ancient world, uh, how much they overlap. You know, people don't move around Roman roads in some kind of browning in motion, uh, but in fact they actually tend to um, uh, take specific um, uh, roads, uh, just as, as, as you would take an interstate for large stretches uh, of, uh, of a drive and not take all of you know, the, the back roads. Um, and what we can do with real geodetic space, uh, we can also do the inverse of. We can actually um, take, the, because if we're annotating images, we can treat the coordinates of those annotations in that image as their own geodetic system. Uh, so one of the fun things we can do is import that image into a GIS um, and then treat the coordinates uh, of those annotations um, as their own geographic space and then connect other content into that. <coughs> so, for example, porcelain chart can't really be fit into a geographic information system because it was never recorded uh, in a geodetically accurate way. But using this kind of approach, we can still import it into a GIS, um, use the coordinates of our annotations as the coordinates to associate things with, 
and then tie other data into that. So we can actually use uh, the portable chart as its own um, GIS system. Uh, and finally, before I kind of come on to Victoria to, to Dito, um, I just wanted to highlight that um, over the past year or so, um, we've been really pushing um, to the, 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 the social, the community aspects of Polygos. Uh, so Polygos uh, is now um, formally the Polygos Commons. Uh, you can find the website at commons.polygos.org. Um, we've got lots of information about what Polygos uh, is trying to, to, try to achieve and, and, and how we go about doing that. Um, and try to um, give as much guidance as possible for anybody who's interested in these sort of like linked open data approaches. In particular, um, we the way that we're um, trying to kind of broaden our activities is through a series of working groups. So every year, so anybody can register uh, on the site, um, and every year uh, we we'll have a call uh, for people to launch new working groups, which are a program of activities which will take place over the next year. Um, so this year we have four: um, one on multilingualism, uh, one on pedagogy. Uh, one on time and temporal aspects of uh, a place, um, and one which we call linked past, uh, and that's trying to um, foster a wider community, um, somewhat independent, ultimately independent of Pelagios, uh, people who are interested in these sorts of linked, uh, lightweight, semantic annotation um, approaches to, to connectivity of, uh, of things online. So if any of you are interested in that, not just in the kind of geo sense, um, but connecting things together um, through any other kinds of concept scheme, then please do uh, let us know um, and get in touch with that um, working group because it's something we'd like to um, get off the ground to say it, it to kind of spin out of, of Pelagios um, because we, we don't want Pelagios to come to be an empire building, if you will. Um, it's got quite a, you know, we, we have plenty to do already, um, but this, you know, this really only works if we're all um, pulling together and working together. So, whatever we can do to make that happen um, and facilitate that, we will. So, um, how are we for the time? We're just about half an hour, right? So um, I'm going to talk now a little bit about Recogito, which is our annotation platform. Or is there anything, is there any burning questions about Polygios before before I do that? So a question. Um, <coughs> I, I, I forget, I've seen maybe a glimpse of the Bastard UI before. Is that based on Solar or Lucene or something else? Uh, I think yeah. it's... Uh, elastic search, which okay. you, I forget which one that's. Is yeah, it it's losing it. Right. Yeah, Tim, so, yes. Uh, so, I linked data is links, and URIs are not links, and URLs are not links. Yeah. So, is Pelagio working on specific link relationships? Yes, so, um, so linked data, traditionally, uh, um, the notion of, sort of semantic web and linked data is based on the idea of, of a combination of uh, URIs, which are, which are global identifiers, web addresses, typically, uh, and RDF, uh, which is a, um, a specification for connecting those things together. And essentially, by saying, I have an identifier for this subject, and I have an identifier for an object, and I have an identifier, uh, or usually an identifier, uh, for an, object, uh, an identifier for the property that connects between them. Um, the approach that we've taken is that we do, what we haven't engaged with uh, with Pelagios um, is the complex ontology modeling um, of mapping out specific kinds of properties in the world or uh, and um, and modeling things in that way. Um, what we use is, is um, what was originally open annotation, which is now morphing into what called web annotations, which are based on the principles of RDF. So it still uses a kind of graph-based approach uh, of having these URIs. Um, but fundamentally, is about modeling relationships between stuff online and references online. Um, web annotations themselves, the body of those annotations, do not necessarily have to be a URI. So I think what we're specifically focused on um, in this particular context is web annotations that where the body is connecting you into a concept scheme, as opposed to other annotation systems where we, I might say, right, here is a particular piece of text, here's an annotation, and here are some things I want to say about that. Um, we're particularly interested in Polygios of saying we want to map that to a concept uh, in a gazetteer. However, um, as you will see uh, in a moment of Recogito, um, we also tend to wind up associating a bunch of other stuff uh, with that, such as who has produced the annotation, uh, such as tags, because sometimes we, we don't have something in a kind of gazetteer and so on. So we're sort of building um, around that. Mm -hmm. um, but does that answer your, your question? So the, the other thing I will mention, um, I can't remember if I've got a slide to this effect. 
we particularly IDF is really powerful as a means for allowing lots of different people in lots of different contexts to produce those annotations. RDF <coughs> typically is not a great format um, in terms of performance and optimization and so on, although things have certainly kind of got better recently. So um, typically, if for um, people produce annotations, store those annotations or make those annotations available as RDF, mm -hmm. but for the purposes of use, people will often, and different people may want to use these in different ways, um, take those annotations, bring them together, and then convert them to some other kind of format for the particular purpose that they want to use that for. So for something uh, like Paracleo, for example, we take the IDF, uh, store it in um, a graph database, so something like Neo4j, uh, rather than a triple store, um, and then um, work with that, and then <coughs> we may also export it to say JSON or some other format for the particular purposes. So, so what my was question was, wasn't actually about RDF. Oh, sorry, ah, okay, right, right, right. <laughs> And we should talk about this later, but yeah, yeah. you know, so people use anchors a lot. Yeah in HTML documents, which has no particular meaning except see also. And right. so the yep. question is, is Pelagio trying to conceptually refine that and say, yeah, we mean same place as here. And we don't mean same place as over here. Yeah, no, we're not trying to, we're, so we're not trying to, to do that. And we're also very reliant on um, on open annotation to a certain degree in terms okay. of, yeah. So we, we have no great web fixes for, you know, these kind of like you know long-standing and challenging issues. I think it's yeah, fair to say. I think uh, I think what we do try to do is fail gracefully, uh, mm -hmm. if you like. So there's a sense of saying, right, I can't tell you exactly where this thing is within a particular document, but at least I can get you to the page, and you can use Control F to find you know, what is presumably the reference. Um, but yeah, ultimately, we you know we don't we don't have any kind of magical source to to yeah correct those kind of things. But open annotations is what you're trying to use to yes, be more precise in exactly. the annotation. Okay. Great. Okay. So, um, so Rekigito. So one of the um, issues always in working with working with, uh, working with data, and again, it's a matter of is frequently a lack of specific tools and technologies to, to, to do certain kinds of things. When Polyglot Poly got started out, we worked with a lot of partners who often had. Uh, a developer, uh, we work with, with, with partner institutions and, and projects where there's often uh, people with technical expertise who could take data and convert it into RDF um, or, or an open annotation. Um, as we moved on, of course, we as we were engaged with more and more people, um, not everybody is in the position to do that kind of thing. So we wanted to make it as easy as possible that somebody can take an image, uh, take a text, um, and mark it up with those annotations and then export those in, into different formats. So. Um, to do that, we created uh, what we call the Repugito platform. Uh, that, the first version of that uh, came out uh, about two and a half, three years ago. Um, and then recently, we've released um, its second iteration, uh, Repugito 2, that in particular focuses on social aspects as well, which we try to make it more social. So the first version was quite centralized in that we had a particular centralized space uh, where all the documents and so on had to be uploaded. Uh, and now we're trying to make it easier for, uh, for individuals to do that. So if you go to recogito.polygios.org, uh, you will uh, get this page. Uh, you can you can sign up. <coughs> um, anybody can sign up, and they get about 200 megabytes worth of, um, of space to, uh, to use. Um, of course, if you're interested, um, you, all of the code is on uh, GitHub, so uh, you can set up your own instance. You, know, you don't have to use the, the, the platform that we have here. Um, so you can uh, register uh, and log on. Uh, and when you do that, it'll take you to your own kind of personal uh, collection page here. Uh, so this is mine, um, and uh, you can see a number of documents that uh, I uploaded uh, quite some time ago. Uh, in fact, so there's the Bordeaux itinerary and a couple of different versions, uh, which I talked about earlier on. Uh, we also have a map, uh, the Hoban map here, uh, which is of Europe um, from 1730, uh, and then we have some text um, as well. And it will give uh, a bunch of metadata. It's not, uh, one thing to underline here, um, it's not a repository. Right? We're not, we are not about um, people storing all of their content and trying to make that public and um, adding lots of kind of complex um, data. Um, but we're trying to make it at least <coughs> simple that for the purpose of annotation, they can figure out what they've got in their collection and distinguish between them. Um, over here, um, annotations, that's those are the number of annotations that, have, uh, that, that I, or, in, or perhaps as we'll see in a moment, somebody else might have um, added to that. Um, and we can also see over here, as so we'll kind of come back to um, whether that document is public or not. 
So if I go into um, Recogito itself, um, I can upload a, um, a, a text here, um, and I can identify um, strings of characters. Um, I can also choose at the process, uh, at the point um, of uploading, uh, we use the Stanford parser, um, if people want to, uh, as doing an automated first pass. So we do geoparsing, which will mean it will go through and identify a bunch of, um, of uh, people, events, um, as suggestions. But to come back to a point about um, this, you know, genuine semantics, we see genuine semantics as somebody, as a person or some agent, looking at it and saying, no, this is a reference to Athens. The, 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 and, uh, um, yes? You said a Stanford parser. Do you mean natural language processing? Yeah, yeah yes, that's okay. right. Yeah. Is that, I guess, it's here based or is it purely based on um, English knowledge? Uh, it is a. It is also again this year based. Um, it's both. Okay. I, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's. I should know this. Um, I don't think it's rules based. I think that they have a. Um, I think it's based on, on on kind of combination of training, but it definitely has gazetteers involved. Um, you can also not in terms of, kind of general users, but again, if you if you go to the code, you can also switch out the parser as well. So we've done it. Um, we've in the past was in the Edinburgh Geoparser as well. So if you have a, the Edinburgh Geoparser. Edinburgh. Uh, so there is a number of of, of um, various NLP parsers that have come out. Um, and again, obviously, you wouldn't want to sort of say that one is better than the other and try to. To make it as easy as possible for what kind of options there. So, um, so you can go. You can have. There is a a, a limited uh, support for a first pass, um, and that clearly makes it easier for people to kind of to go through, and they don't have to select all of um, the text straight out. But then, when we do that, we can. You can see here that Ithaca has been marked in grey. That means that um, that either the individual or a geoparser has gone through and said, um, "This is. I think that this is a reference to something." If I click on it. I can get this uh, pop up here, um, and that tells me what the um, presumed or the, the system will have a guess at what that match is. So here it said, I think this is the island of Ithaca, um, which is a place associated with this particular um, entry of Pleiades, um, the ID 530906, um, and a little bit of, of uh, information associated with it. Um, you can see there's a warning sign saying automatic match. So that hasn't been confirmed by a human being yet. And I can now go through and confirm that and say, yes, that's right. Uh, I can delete it um, or I can change it. Uh, if I want to confirm it, in this particular case, um, I do, because that is the Ithaca that I want to uh, refer to, I think. Um, then I can also get a pop up here to make, an, make this a faster process and say, um, oh, this is actually a, for a different example. Uh, but here I've got more, uh, several more occurrences of the Red Sea. Um, if Red Sea had been the one that was highlighted, so that I don't have to go through every single entry. I can, I, I can um, much more rapidly go through something that has been pre-processed and say, yes, those are the places that I'm referring to. If I don't like um, the example, if I'm not sure about it, and I go to change, um, so here somebody's less sure about uh, a reference to Tarico um, in a the text, then I get this pop-up uh, over here, um, and down the left-hand side, I have a whole series of, of um, what the system is guessing um, might be references um, to Taraco. Um, if I click on one of those, in this particular case here, I can actually see that there are two entries which have been aligned, uh, which are in, in different gazetteers which have been aligned. So I have one gazetteer uh, Pleiades, and I have another one, the Digital Atlas of the Roman Empire. They both have references to um, a Taraco, a Taraco, but because they've been aligned, it doesn't matter too much which one I select. So I can still crosswalk between those. Um, so if I uh, link into there, and somebody else in a different document uh, links through to Pleiades, uh, we would still know that we were talking about the same places. Conversely, I don't. We have a, uh, if somebody was to link to here, um, the circus, uh, Taraco, then we wouldn't know. Okay, that we wouldn't know that, that we wouldn't. There would be no crosswalking uh, between those two different places. Is there is there anything enforced when two places are deemed the same in terms of? Space or time or name? No. Um, so in terms, I think we what we usually um, the the in sort of Scots vocabulary, we tend to use a close match um, assumption, which is that in some contexts um, these two places can be treated as the same, um, but we essentially leave it to whoever is going to use these annotations um, to make their own decision about whether it's relevant to them. So sometimes it's close enough, sometimes it isn't, and I think that's one of the reasons why we want to keep that flexibility and not try and shift. <coughs> Um, 
With the, uh, the new version of Recodito that wasn't possible before, we can also have um, overlapping um, annotations. Um, and we can also have annotations uh, of different kinds of entity. So we can have references to places, uh, references to persons, references to events. <laughs> One thing that we do need to highlight about Flygos is that we focus specifically on geo annotation. So uh, in terms of having a kind of a pop-up um, system which will make it reasonably or try and facilitate that process of finding the right place match, but obviously we don't have that for persons or events. All we can do is say, this is a reference to what I consider to be a person. I might also want to tag, I can could, I could add a comment uh, about that. I'll have, they say, the text string or the fragment of the image that's associated with it. And I can add in tags, um, which of course are not sort of first order uh, linked data or semantic web uh, URIs, um, but do give us uh, a kind of folksonomy or allow people to develop a kind of bottom-up folksonomy. Yeah. So you can say it's a person, can you say it's this person with this URI, or you can just say it's So you could, if you had a different, um, uh, if, you, if, if, you, if you went into Viaf, for example, and you, said you found the person you, kind of, you, you were interested in, you could add that here um, as a comment currently. Okay, just as a comment. But just as a comment. Mm -hmm. um, one thing we can certainly do, and I don't know if it's on a roadmap, is perhaps add a kind of like a, you know, a, you know, the opportunity to add in a URI as a body. And, and I don't know if that's, that's probably something we should, it's not on a roadmap we should have. But it's but here, essentially, you're adding text, or you're adding text. Uh, and, and that's more or less the way it's going to stay um, for Pilatios um, for the foreseeable future. Uh, and we can also, um, for a particular text, having marked, uh, marked it up, um, we can also, if you just look at the top here, so we can have a text view with a blue circle, uh, the blue um, pencil on paper icon, um, but the icon over to the right will then give us a visual, um, uh, a kind of geographic uh, mapping version of the same text, um, where we'll have uh, different um, points for different places. If we happen to have uh, polygons, if the gazetteer uh, happens to provide polygons for a particular place, uh, we can represent those two, which of course can be quite useful for uh, representing regions. Um, the size of our points uh, reflects here um, how frequently a particular place is referred to, so um, you do at least kind of get a limited sense of which are the, the most significant places uh, within a text. Uh, and if I click on any of these places, I can also jump straight back again to the particular um, fragment of the image or the fragment of the text um, with a little bit around it, if it's the text, you can get the surrounding uh, information as well. Yeah. Sometimes there are some issues with gazetteers that that has a bunch of places, and sometimes the place might be, and you, and you have a latitude, longitude, but is, does that place represent an entire country? Is yeah. it a city? Yeah. Is yeah. it a yeah. town? Yeah. Is it literally the street address? Yeah. You know. So without that extra data, how do you draw that on the map? You know, and at what scale? You know. So yeah. That's just an issue I've seen in some, some data sets. I mean, it's, it's a very significant uh, challenge, really. And so I think over time, I think the way that we would see, see the kind of the linked data verse evolving is that you want particular stakeholders within, within that to work on particular problems. And, and so ideally, over time, uh, gazetteer providers would do a lot of work on, say, alignment uh, or, or over time improving the kinds of geodata that they have associated with something. So some gazetteers may start off with no coordinates at all, uh, and then at some point um, they might be able to invest in giving broad, you know, um, basic coordinates, and then as time progresses, they might be able to, to add in specific kinds of um, polygonal data for for that as 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 they go. There are, however, some uh, geographic entities um, or entities which are used in a geographic way where you where that's not really possible. So um, uh, the territory of, of a a tribe, for example, is something that giving it a specific, um, anything other than a fairly generic kind of point, is fairly pointless. Drawing boundaries around it is even more misleading, if you will, um, than adding um, particular points. So there's a degree of horses of courses here. Um, there's also the fact that sometimes these coordinates are disputed, especially if you're talking about the ancient world. Um, one of the reasons for having the digital atlas of Roman Empire and uh, Theodes as two separate gazetteers mm -hmm. is they have slightly different sets of coordinates um, associated with them. And depending on which backing map you want to be able to show that on, um, you might want to use one set of, 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 of coordinates um, over the other. Otherwise, if you're projecting data onto that um, rasterized backing map, then it, it's sort of slightly out of alignment. Um, the nice thing is because they're aligned, you can actually on the fly, uh, even if you're aligned to Theodes, you can use the digital atlas of Roman Empire coordinates and vice versa, um, as long as you know that sort of thing. So, um, it's, I would say it's a perfect system in all cases. Um, you can have a surprisingly large part of your paper uh, edited. 
<laughs> um, what we can do for text, uh, we can get, as I mentioned before, we can do for images, so here's a portable chart, uh, and we can, um, again, draw bounding boxes or points um, around things. So some, there are some cases where perhaps um, places are referenced with little um, symbols. In that case, you might want to have a point. Um, so say this is, that point is where it's actually located, the place is located on the map. In other cases, you may just have labels, it's often the case with portal and charts, uh, and you might want to draw a bounding box around that particular label to locate the place. Yeah. Just yes. so I understand, so yeah. sort of the uh, uh, main use case, so if somebody annotates something like this, or a tag document, yeah. in both cases the document or the image is uploaded to Palladios, Recookies first. It's right, uh, it's right, it's right, it's right, it's onto the right. server. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, and then the the lightweight annotation gets published once the user is ready, I guess, out to uh, open annotation format. So I'll come to that. Link data. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, and and the link data is referring to um, two documents that are on the Recogito server. Not to perhaps, let's say it's a typical museum, not to the image on their server, obviously. That's no, that, and not that to the document yeah. that might be hosted in their official museum archive, yeah. of course. Yeah. So I'm very interested in how that. I mean, maybe. You'll Sorry, I, I, that. That, that's a great question, um, and I, which I wasn't clear about. It's the other way around. So the idea of Recogito is not to host that content and not to point to a document hosted in Recogito necessarily. But to say, here is a document that we have on, that is that exists somewhere else online. To give it the URI for that, but as long as you're using the same image or text to be able to point back, <coughs> so Recogito is a tool for producing annotations that point to something over here and something over here, not a tool for saying here is something on Recogito right. and here is that. Right. Gets so the fine grained, you know, this word. That's why you said. Yeah, that's why you said go to the page and hit Control F, or Depending on go to the page and find that. Yeah. Yeah. Tiny place name somewhere in the huge image. It's for example. Yeah. But right. with open annotation, yeah. you can at least within the annotation say it's if it's the same image, if it's the same raster essentially, you can still point to that fragment. Um, right. but it will depend on the tool or whatever it is, you know, the browser you're looking you're using, whether it's capable of doing that. Yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. Well, can I make a comment based on my own use? So I thought the way it worked is for example, here's an image. This is an object. So even though we've uploaded it, it's it's got some kind of URI or some kind of object yep. identifier, we make an annotation on it. Yep. Now that annotation is only related to the object so far. Later we could say this annotation also refers to some place in a gazette here. And that's that's the Pelagios linked open data reference to the gazetteer object. So you're doing both. You're saying here's this object, yep. it has an identifier, here's a bunch of annotations related to it. Yep. And incidentally I've also attested to the relationships between the annotations themselves and some guest here reference. So it is linked open data sure. in both directions and you are yeah, holding yeah. it as an object with an identifier. Yeah. I so, think. Yeah, so and, and then okay. I'll come back to how that data is produced is is produced. That then it then we that you then have to export it and you can use it in a variety of different ways. Okay. So, so if we understand Recogito is primarily a workspace for creating annotations. For yes. content which is online elsewhere. That's right. Okay. And so when you upload it, you have to specify the URI of where your content actually is. Yeah. You don't have. I should say you don't have to. That's not a. It is not a requirement. If you just want to have an image and you just want to do that, you can do that too. And one of the reasons that we found that some people were less concerned with that and they just wanted to have some content and annotate it and map it and whatever, and that's fine. You know, we don't want to stop people doing that. But yes, that is uh, you know, the, the, the basic principle, the, the, the basic, the fundament, the fundamental motivating, uh, motivating force for what you do is precisely that. Uh, and for images, um, we can also again we can annotate people, for example, or events. If that's weird. so, one more thing to work. You know, remember, I mean, maps aren't just documents about places, but they contain also some other interesting stuff too. Uh, so. Um, the other thing we wanted to do was make it as easy as possible for people to work collectively, to do so socially, because some of these documents can be really big, and you might want to work um, um, either individually, uh, so either, either privately, or, or with a uh, specific group. So here I've um, shared it with other members of, for example, uh, of the, um, the team here. 
and I can set the permissions so they can look at a document that I've annotated, but I can also allow them to annotate that document uh, in real time with me. So as they edit, it, as they produce annotations, those will appear on my document so that we don't wind up kind of clashing uh, too much. If I want to, I can even make it public so that other people can see my annotations uh, as well. But as you'll see here, um, one of the things that we particularly um, ran into in terms of uh, Plagios 3, the, our first version of the Red Veto, um, was copyright. And so if people are, are, are annotating documents, which they found uh, in, in other repositories, then we don't want them taking that, uploading it to Recogito, and then using it as it were, um, or abusing it, I should say, um, as a hosting service um, for copyright, uh, for, for content that doesn't kind of belong to them. Right. So if, if people do want to make a document and annotations visible, then they have to set, uh, in the metadata settings, they need to talk about um, the license. So here, uh, we've got document metadata, we saw some of that before. Uh, here's my border itinerary taken from some um, uh, uh, Christian uh, website. Uh, and then I'd have to select um, a license here about, about it. And that gives everything from um, open licenses, in which case I'll be able to make it public, um, to um, things which are copyright, uh, in which case I won't, um, or I don't know, in which case I can't make it public. So have you run into the problem of people saying, grabbing something that's published that they don't have a license to, loading it into Recogito in order to make the annotations, which it's legal to make a link back to yeah, yeah, yeah. somebody's yeah. content. We didn't run into it, but that's because in the first instance of Recogito, we didn't make anything public because we because we were aware of these kind of copyright things. Yeah. And lots of people, however, lots of people got really interested and wanted to annotate stuff, so we had to have a fairly kind of complicated login system. Um, and because everything was in a large public space, it became, it ever more became this kind of private repository that if you had the keys to, you could have, and we, uh, yeah, clearly that wasn't really a sustainable model. Mm -hmm. So here, everybody has their own private space. If for a specific reason they want to make it uh, publicly available, and also, yeah, we want to encourage people to do that if it's useful to them in a particular uh, kind of context. Mm -hmm. But we do need to make sure that that's happening responsibly. And it's, um, so, um, and then yeah, last of all, so in terms of um, it being a platform where you can produce annotations, you can then download those annotations in a variety of different formats depending on what it is that you want to do. Um, very frequently, CSV is the thing that people want. You know, they, they have a text, um, they want to kind of um, find the places, get the coordinates, stick it on the map, uh, and CSV is really great for that. Um, so that's very common. Um, for web developers, obviously, um, JSON um, LD is, is um, perhaps the most kind of common. But of course, we also make it uh, evolve, uh, available as RDF um, as well. Um, GeoJSON works, uh, KML, I think, is under develop, development. Um, and TEI, if you want to download text um, with a TEI markup. Uh, unfortunately, we don't yet do TEI import, so you can't take a TEI text and import it to Recogito, um, but you can, you can take a text, um, mark it up, and then it will, it will export it as a TEI marked up document with, um, with the annotations within it. So that's Recogito. Um, oh, and we're perfectly on the hour, so I feel uh, good about that. Um, here are a number of um, things if you're interested in, in pursuing um, Recogito or learning more about Recogito. So um, the actual site, if you want to register and play around with it, is at recogitoplagios.org. Um, there's a tutorial, and it's that tutorial that we'll be looking at MIT later on today. Um, so if you're not able to join us or you want to have a play around later on, um, that's probably the best way to get started. Um, if you're really interested in it, um, and especially if you're into, into kind of coding, um, the GitHub uh, site is a great place to kind of get hold of the code on the one hand, uh, but you can also um, report issues or request features as well. Currently, we're focused on developing um, Pair of Player, but towards the end of the year, there'll be some time, I think, to do a little bit more um, specific, very specific kind of development work, and of course, something that, that um, as we move on into 2018, um, we'll have a, have a roadmap for further developments. Um, and we also on the card uh, on the uh, on our website comes to podcast um, if you go to uh, links uh, link data and the Recogito page then you can also have a, a link to the Recogito users forum um, where you can post um, uh, comments or questions about Recogito you can also contact my uh, colleague uh, Ryan Simon but what we really try to encourage people is to think at kind of a community level so rather than having um, lots of kind of one-to-one -one conversations to try and have those as much as around as we, as we can. Um, 
So, yeah, thank you very much um, for listening. I'm very happy to either A, take questions and B, move on to kind of more general discussions about, about the data. Uh, and anybody who has to leave, um, but wants to come and join us, I'd like to be very welcome. So. So if you're referencing a, a map image in some library collection somewhere and marking it up in your code, then does that require that the image is shared with IIF, or is there some protocol that's assumed for referencing places on the image? In um, so we, that's something we, we are um, increasingly wanting to do more with is, is IIIF. Um, so certainly in kind of pair of player, for example, we've been using more of um, the IIIF uh, scheme so that when you're Exploring particular images that have been um, uh, have been annotated and that you can explore as data, um, then if that data is a triple image, you can use that in various ways. Um, I think in terms of, but it, there is no requirement that, that the image be in a triple um, for it because whilst we think it's a really fantastic technology, it, I don't. It's not widely used enough mm -hmm. in particular um, stage. I think it's something that's kind of continuously evolving and we're. We're trying to work with people who are doing that. Um, it's, just, it's, a, it's a great process, but it's a slow one that we're, we're just trying to kind of follow along with. So your image annotations are not triple IF? Uh, are, no, I think, no, that's right. Um, but they do, if the image itself is served by a triple IF server, um, uh, I would be careful that I'm not going to kind of put it where the right in his mouth, as it were. Um, your pair of player, if those images are on triple IF server, Makes use of it, but the annotations themselves are not in terms of their their token annotation. What's that triple IIF? I don't know. What that is. Uh, triple IIF is called the, is the international. I think it's right in the international interoperability image in, 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 interoperability mm. framework, mm. Um, and it's a framework that enables you to um, <coughs> it has a series of protocols that uh, a particular server can can give it specific kinds of information associated with metadata associated with the image. Um, that mean you can annotate it, present it in all sorts of, kind of uh, variety of ways. I'm not the expert uh, on it, but it is a, um, a, a kind of growing and, and um, sort of ever more advocated for um, framework, if you like. For Triple IF include w, consideration of WMS? Uh, I think there is some, I think, um, I, don't, I don't think it does formally. Because it's not a it's not a geospatial forum. However, uh, Peter Dahl, I don't know if you, some of you may if you work in kind of, kind of geospatial area, area uh, will know. Um, so he's done some stuff. If I remember, if I remember this kind of correctly, basically <coughs> combining IIIF with geospatial format. So he's got a, a, a map viewer where you can both you can essentially treat the image both as a map and as a kind of a IIIF. Um, image. So I forget off the top of my head what it's called, but if you go to Open Technologies webpage, it's listed as one of these mm -hmm. projects. What about the uh, <clears throat> morphology of cities themselves? So like a lot of your references are to places like say this is a city, this is a town, but in an important city you're going to have a lot of different periods with different architecture and different sites and different things demolished. And so I'm wondering um, is there some way that Recogito could fit into this context, for example, like, okay, this map I'm working on is related to the city, yeah. but it has all these locations on it that I'm annotating, and then using, like, Google Map or something, finding out where they specifically really are. Yeah. And then you could kind of, like, harvest that information as a, a subset historically for one of the places yeah. in a gazetteer. So... It, that's a really good question, and I think it's something that we're, we we really want to figure out, kind of with the community, um, whether a, a natural tension lies that, that for the, for which there is not necessarily a, like a single optimal solution. So the first thing that's kind of worth saying is that you're absolutely right, and so my, what we call micro regions um, and gazetteers for micro regions are really important. There are lots and lots of cases where where we you know, a lot of the gazetteers that we work at are in that kind of large regional scale with references to kind of the settlements and so on. Now, of course, within any within any, any gazetteer, and as you saw in, in our example with, with, uh, with Pleiades, there it is. Uh, you you can have a reference to Taraco, and you can have a reference to the circus in Taraco, um, but you probably wouldn't want a gazetteer that tried to have a reference to absolutely everything everywhere because it's just going to get completely out of control. 
So hence, what does seem to make sense is this you know, world uh, where we have multiple gazetteers, and some of them are focused on um, sort of large, wide-ranging, uh, kind of, you know, um, large-scale stuff, and then others uh, might be kind of focused on a particular city uh, and the streets and buildings uh, within that. And you may have some, you know, a, a marginal amount of overlap, but otherwise it could be substantively quite different. So we really want to see that world with lots of gazetteers. The challenge that we are, are faced with, and this is a social much more than a technical challenge, is that if you make it really easy for people to produce new gazetteers, then the tendency is that that becomes the default. People go like, oh, well, I could map all of that stuff to um, GU names, but actually I've got my own spreadsheet, or my own gazetteer that I kind of compiled uh, 10 years ago and I linked all my things to. So why don't I just turn that into a gazetteer? Right? So, then they've got links to their gazetteer, something else is linked to GNames, and you're right back where you started. Right? You have this, this co-referencing problem because there isn't an alignment between them. So what we really want is a sort of nudge, a social nudge to people, that where possible, <coughs> they are connecting to gazetteers which are part of, so that are aligned with other things. And they, they only resort to these alternative gazetteers when that's a necessary thing. And quite how we figured that out, I think, is probably one of the other kind of the, the questions we really need to focus on next. As a community, I don't think it's something that Pelagios, as it were, you know, as a, an investigative team, can impose and say this is what you need to do. But it's something that we collectively, with um, with the kind of wider community, can figure out what what is the right balance of, uh, you know, discouraging people from producing gases here every time it seems really um, making it easy. And yet, you know, I don't know. I don't. I don't have. And I'd love to hear people's ideas about about how we, we achieve that. Um. So just thinking about what little. I mean, I just. I don't know a lot about linked data, but I know DBpedia is sort of the mother load of linked data. Uh, w w it's, it's, uh, Wiki, Wikidata is somewhat is somewhat taken over the role of DBpedia. But yeah, sure. I mean, oh, Wikidata. They're, they're, they're very okay. similar. They're, okay. they're largely based on. The same yeah. Um, nice thing being that everything's persistently hosted, and perhaps even editable ultimately. Right. Right. Uh, and then on the geo side, geo names. Yeah. Um, how how do those two play in here, and if and, and if not, why not? So geonames we already use. Right. Um, Wikidata. So everything gets tied to geonames if there is a corresponding geoname. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 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 if you use Wikidata, geonames is one of the gazetteers that we've included, yeah. and if you want to link it to if if it's just the geonames identifier, then it'll pop up, and if it doesn't, yeah. then it won't. Yeah. Um, Wikidata is something. That we're again we're really interested in and following. Um, and the past place, for example, one of the gazetteers that we sort of saw there, um, is is an attempt as a gazetteer to potentially filter out place references from Wikidata. Because Wikidata, although it, it, it does classify and categorize um, a lot of places, there's again, because it's based on Wikidata, you have this huge range in scale of, of you know, notable everything from kind of notable buildings. You know, right, you know, right through to Earth uh, or you know, kind of planetary bodies or yeah. something like that. So, um, so some of the issue is about how how it taking how do you we could link things through Wikidata, but how would you make it easily findable? Um, and some one of the ways to do that is to have gazetteers that extract essentially extract URIs for that that are automatically aligned with Wikidata, but are use, useful as specific subsets. Does that make sense? So you could. Yeah, I guess I would think, I, I was thinking more along the lines of within an annotation tool, yeah. you'd have, you, you'd make it easy, I don't know, would it be useful to make it easy to be able to choose the right entity in Wikidata for a given place, So right? Because yeah. there you've got yeah. this semi-canonical yeah. ch chunk of, you know, a pair of stuff. Yeah. Um, I would think it would be very tricky to do what you were just saying, um, and and it doesn't, and that seems almost portal building, which you're saying you wouldn't. Yeah, I don't think there's a particular interest in, in, in portal building. He, I mean, it, it ultimately it does sort of, yeah, boil, it boils down to how do you find the entity that you're interested in. But if you, when you have a data set in Wiki, like Wikidata where maybe five percent of the of the things in there are place references. And ninety-five percent of them are something else. Yeah. Then every every time I search for, you know, say, the city of Reading, and I'm getting right. references to Reading or whatever it is, it, you're you're massively cluttering it. It becomes much much harder to to, to find the place that you're particularly interested in. Yeah. 
Right. Um, we've also found, and this is true of, of city, again of, of cities, is that often you want to refer to a city, but you suddenly have 200 or more references to um, in Boston Airport and Boston Cathedral and Boston so on and so on and so on. And so you then have to kind of go through a list of 50 different places to find. Yeah. So the Wikidata possible. API isn't very, isn't very smart. It's I not very fine grained. Yeah, that's probably that's, with, that's when probably, it comes to space. It's not very fine grained, yeah. um, and it's also, of course, very. You know, whenever you get these kind of big aggregation, kind of folk, uh, you know, or, right. or, or aggregated data sets, right. the way in which things are classified also varies tremendously from yeah. from, from data point. Right, but on the other, the flip side, it would seem to be a great opportunity within an annotation framework to start improving the fine, the grain on wiki. So on there's wiki stuff data. stuff in like Wikipedia and Bbpedia that. Is largely stable is slowly getting organized, but right. a lot of it is not stable. So yeah, 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 that's, yeah. that's the problem. That's the yeah. problem. Um, so yeah. I think I, I still think 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 of this as, an, as a kind of ecology of projects as well. Mm -hmm. That's one of the ways that that this can work. We think this can work can work best is where you have particular projects specialized by saying right, we're going to yeah, we so like past place, we're going to extract a subset of Wikidata. They may or may not mint additional URIs for it, but it's going to remain aligned with <coughs> right. um, And that, again, makes everybody else's life much easier because then they can just point, they can use that as a mechanism for getting to the data, which in turn they bridge through. That makes a lot of sense. Um, you, you mentioned that you have a ballpark account of how many images you have in the system um, or, or how many points people have annotated on? Um, just I have what, what's the, yeah, right. the latest thing. I think it's hard to say the latest thing because Record Two <clears throat> has been going for past six months in various kinds of phases of kind of alpha and beta. But it, it, so in terms of users, um, we've got about well, about three hundred people registered for on the the, the largest website. Certainly not all of you have used Record Two. Um, but we're probably in, you know, over the 100, 150 people, I think, who've kind of registered mm -hmm. or kind of connected. And then within there, you get a real, you know, there is obviously lots of those that had to play around, create a handful of annotations, and we have other people who produce thousands and thousands of annotations to specific documents to get it to. So it's, it, you know, it's clearly, it tends to be a long tail distribution mm -hmm. where for some people, it's really useful. Um, for other people, you know, it's interesting and maybe they can kind of think of ways to, Fit into their workflow, and, and they want. But that's the that's one way we work out. And all your annotations are manually made. So again, okay, I think semi on semi semi. We we yeah. like to have the flexibility of all of it. So you could, if you want, just upload your document, let the stand good parser at it, download it, and so say that's me geo parsed my stuff. That's um, a text file. Exactly. For exactly. Sorry. For a text yeah, file. Yeah. Exactly. But for that. No, for so exactly for images. No, we've done some work in the past to see whether we could get um, automated um, boundary box writing around um, labels and so on. I think, and this is probably fairly true, even more true than it was a text. That the amount of the time it took you to clean up was not so dissimilar from the time that it took you to do this stuff yourself, right. um, and that's for you know a variety of reasons. So. I think we would certainly be interested. I mean, if, you, if, if there are people here or people that you know of who are doing, um, I think there's a team at Würzburg who are doing some interesting stuff around um, vectorization of labels and so on. So we'd be really interested if that's the kind of thing that we can kind of plug in. Again, anything we can do that facilitates process would be good. But we, we, it wasn't an, uh, something that we were able to either crack or find a, a useful library at this stage that, that enabled us to do that. Could be easy. Let's say I have an assistant and I'm going to have her spend all summer annotating some maps. Yeah. And um, I'm concerned that uh, we do it in a way that <laughs> we're guaranteed that there will be some way to read and access these animations, uh, annotations um, 10 years from now. Um, what would your advice be for me? I mean, is that, are we, are we kind of, do we have something like that at this point or? I think, I? I think, so, 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 it is we're saying that neither Polygon nor Ito is a, um, a sustainability plan, 
if that makes sense, right? So what it could be, what, what I think in terms of good practice, you would produce annotations, you would download them, you would store them somewhere, and you would probably do that in you know in a, a, a simpler format, I would argue, as possible. I think so. Things like CSV are actually really good for, for doing things because they're you know they're plain text, and and something's going to be able to read that in ten years' time. Um, it's pretty likely that um, you're going to be able to read RDF and open annotation in a few in, in ten years' time to some degree, but it's also entirely possible, as is, we see with open annotations, that become more simple. We have annotations that it may well have fallen out of you know being you know the, a, a, a popular but once you know yeah, relative. But, to but you're talking about a pretty low level, but I, what I'm yeah. talking about is kind of an app. They right. would take my annotations and link them back to this map that we'd originally yeah, yeah, used yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and allow a user to sort of like look at it and enjoy the annotations without having to think about CSV or anything yeah. like that. So I think for that kind of thing, I think where we're really going is, is, is IIIF, um, mm -hmm. where there are a range of different um, visualization client, or, uh, um, clients for, for um, viewing IIIF annotations if you wanted to do or deal with maps. Like they kind of moved so uh, mirror door and two or three others um, in various different um, degrees of development but because it's a standard because it's something that's been kind of agreed then even if those particular clients themselves aren't around in 10 years um, it's pretty likely that that something will be mm -hmm. um, and that you should be able to contribute to them in that way um, so it is a slight, it's evolving um, but but that's definitely what I would be going with it. thank you yeah, so, there's actually an OGC standard for mm -hmm. annotating images in the image coordinate space. Right. It's very old. Right. Um, basically, nobody bothered with it. They just went and did stuff like IIF. Okay, right. But, uh, Which, if you, so, right. again, I, if, you, yeah. if you think that's better to go with, then... I'm Not necessarily. Right. I mean, it is pretty old, but um, there was this idea, well, you know, that the, the geospatial standards don't apply to other spaces. And right. So this W3C group, which is working on spatial web data, is explicitly spatial and is trying to emphasize that <clears throat> you can choose other coordinate systems for local spaces, including right. images. So um, hopefully that will allow some sort of uh, alignment between that IIF work and that would some be of the... Because, you know, it would be nice to be able to have a, a service interface that you know, got you a, a geospatial, you know, an Earth map, a Mars map, yeah. a image map, yeah. whichever. I mean, think we've, one thing that we've kind of distinguished before between, I guess, is that, so in terms of the documents mm -hmm. themselves, we've largely treated them, especially for image documents, as images mm -hmm. rather than as spatial content. Whereas conversely, the Gazetteer reference, that, is, that may well have a G, you know, <coughs> have coordinates represented in some kind of standardized standard geospatial uh, format. Um, I think the re part of the reason, in particular, in our case, because we, when we started, we were looking at early geographic documents, and of course, there isn't really a gene genetic way that you can refer to something on a portal and chart. You might know happen. The only reason that you know where it happened to know where it is because you've said that this is something within a gazetteer, and then you derive the coordinates from that. Okay. So in that case, we can really kind of only use it as, um, uh, as images. Uh, but nonetheless, um, each time you do this, in a sense, you also create a kind of control point, which might allow you to do a certain degree of kind of you know, rough georeferencing as well. So that, uh, with lots of control, you have far more control points than normally that you would you know, add in. So there's, there's potential to do fun things like that as well. Um, so one of the ideas is if you publish something with a an image coordinate system, then you can annotate, you know, this pixel position on the map. Mm. But if it's expressed in, you know, CRSWKT or something like that, then yep. when you have control points or you assert them, then you can use a normal projection mechanism actually to to transform that. Right. And so that's the hope is that you know it's part of the spectrum of of alignment and not something entirely yeah. separate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in the interest of time, we're pretty much bumping up against our finishing time. So I want to thank the speaker again for joining us and open up the discussion for anybody who wants to stay to specifically talk about linked open data methods, prospects, and so on. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>